Hello everyone and welcome back for our final game, not just of the day, but of the entire weekend itself. We got a dominant Dignitas facing off against CLG, who are finishing their first week with their full intended starting roster. They got Broxa, Poba's been sub back in, but things really haven't changed that much, you know, despite, I think, some okay individual performances from them. The issues feel the same, right? You know, whether it's this roster, whether it's the previous roster, CLG is able to draft okay. They're able to get themselves into winning positions. They're able to do okay in the early game. Where it all feels like it falls apart is the mid and the late game. The decision-making, the shot calling, they're not on the same page and they're not making the right choices, which is strange because it is a team with so many veterans, so much experience, but it just hasn't come together for them. And, you know, when yeah. you compare the early games, it's honestly pretty darn similar, right? You know, CLG has actually gotten every single first blood. They're like 11 for 11 or, or whatever it is at this point now. They have basically the, uh, the same type of early game success as Dignitas. You know, Dignitas doesn't have a, a dominant early game, but they have seven times as many wins as CLG. It's just crazy to see that these two teams are in similar positions week over week, but CLG is, is in such a varied direction from where Dignitas is. You know, Dignitas is able to make the right calls, is to be able to be on the same page. Their teamwork is often on point. You know, whether that's Aframu or a whole team uh, thing going on there, they feel cohesive. Whereas CLG feels like a group of individuals playing League of Legends together. Yes. But one thing about CLG, man, I read uh, one of Brox's tweets from earlier on this weekend, and it was just like a damn if that doesn't like just encapsulate the feeling where he talked about it's getting hard to find something meaningful to tweet after these games like the players themselves realize how frustrating this is they realize how demoralizing it is to be sitting on a record like one in ten to be here with this level of experience and not be able to get wins so hopefully for CLG they've been able to break down and dissect a little bit of what's going on how they need to improve it because at one in ten and remember for everybody who forgot, this isn't the XD spring split doesn't matter from 2020. This record follows you all the way through summer, mm -hmm. all the way up until the playoffs in summer that qualify teams for Worlds. This follows you. CLG already has 10 losses on that record, and CLG needs to start turning things around here soon if they want to have any chance of staying in contention for yeah. things later on in the year. And they also weren't a team that was supposed to be going through a rebuild, right? They weren't one of these development rosters. They were stacking veterans to have success, right? They were getting all of these veteran players to attempt to actually make things happen early on, to reach playoffs, to go beyond that. Hasn't happened just yet. I, I would really love to see Finn bring out Kled. I know it's not going to happen here, but he is really well known for the pick, and it's something that we don't really get to see in pro play these days. But first pick, Azir, going to be coming out for Dignitas and the Olaf. Seems like the natural response with Hecarim with Udyr already banned out. Yep. Well, Olaf is locked in. Azir locked in, as you already mentioned. Going through the bands since I was talking about other stuff when those happened. It's Senna, Irelia, Twisted Fate, Seraphine, Hecarim, and Udyr all banned away. CLG thinking about what else they want to draft next to that Olaf here. Uh, let's see what it's going to be. Hovering over Bard for quite a while, but Bard doesn't feel like one of those champions that you just lock in second pick, having only seen the enemy mid laner. Rel, however is a champion that you lock in whenever and wherever you can because of her power in the current metagame, and that will be the pick here for CLG. Strong to engage with, strong to peel with, really does work very well overall. Uh, Kai'Sa, another real hard hitter in the meta these days. And this is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting if we're going to see parity or not, because Dignitas just locked in their bot lane. You know, they have their mid lane now. Uh, so at the very least, CLG does have their jungler locked in, and Dignitas does not. Of course, when you're going against Dardoch, I don't even think it's worth spending second round bans on Dardoch because you probably have, have no idea what he's going to play anyway. You may as well throw a dart at the wall. <laughs> You'll have his yeah, you're just like, oh, well, best. which one of these will it be? Hmm, well, instead, they're just going to go okay. ahead. They've got the, it's, so it's mid laner bot laner versus jungler bot laners for the two sides here. So slightly mismatched, but too, everything well. in the bottom lane is taken care of. Right, so it could it could be the Azir versus Tristana matchup. We did just see that, so uh, there is that possibility. You always have to true, true. have to watch out for that. Um, but of course, it could be Turtle piloting it. Always love the Tristana here early, but you know there is still the threat of both of the solo lanes being picked later for CLG. So they are going to have their uh, ability to answer that. You know, I do think likely we'll see the the last pick left for top lane. Um, we'll see exactly where they do want to ban though. 
Gnar going to be banned out here. Aurelia has already been banned out, so a little bit of a thinning of the pool up in top lane, but nothing too extreme. Renekton is still available. One of those big picks that has fallen in priority somewhat, but is still actually very, very strong in the meta, has performed extremely well in North America and has a lot of really strong pairings uh, with some of the popular junglers out there. You know, Lilia, uh, of course, can be good, but Nidalee plus Renekton, even Talia plus Renekton, which has fallen off, but those are both really strong pairings and are available. Zoe, Lilia, Nar, all banned away. What's the last one going to be here from the side of Dignitas? It will be the Syndra, recognizing that CLG must at least blind pick one of these laners. They want to make sure. But then again, Syndra already knows she's going up against the Azir, so it doesn't really matter that much. But they will at least protect Azir from that matchup where he could get bursted out. So let's see what CLG wants to go for here. I expect them. Okay to leave that top lane choice for last. Yep, and then Victor's picked up, so that means Tristana will be bottom lane. I actually really like Victor in the meta. It is something that is not nearly as popular as, as some of those other big three, um, but you know, with Orianna still on the table, they do like to go with Victor anyway. It does have really long range wave clear. The team fighting is very powerful, and this champion scales exceptionally well. You do have the ability to absolutely zero people out. When you get to you know the two, three item mark, when you have a Lich Bane, when you have your upgraded abilities, uh, the burst potential is absolutely incredible if you can get up on some of these squishy targets. So pretty strong pick overall. And it will be Renekton. Could be. You know, Renekton plus Nidalee, like I was talking about, I think that would make sense here, but it is Dardoch, so we don't really know exactly where he wants to take us. Hey! That pairing's a classic, right? You know, it's it's so strong, and there's nothing that you're really going to be that... Oh, Kled! There you go, Isaac! There we go! Okay. You were talking about, you said you know he ain't going to pick it, but well, there it is! Well, he going to blind pick it first, right? You know, there's no way that, that was going to happen. This is the first time he's actually played it since coming over to NA. Kled is initially how Finn kind of made his name for himself in pro play. Uh, he really was specifically known for this pick. It was kind of his pocket pick. And I used to watch a, a fair bit of his games in EU just anytime he would bring it out. I would love to go watch that because this is one of my favorite champions. I will say, when you talk to a lot of you know the, the top level Kled players, Renekton is a matchup they're sometimes scared of. Kled plus Olaf, though, is an incredibly strong duo. So if you are bringing the junglers up and getting them involved, I, I do like that. But I will say that, like, Fiora, Jax, Renekton can all be fairly difficult. And, and one of the reasons is simply that, you know, Renekton, if he can get you dismounted, can then back off, wait till the stun comes back up, and then often burst you down before you have the opportunity to remount. Like, that is the really scary thing, is that these champions that have CC plus burst, you don't get enough hits off to actually get your courage back and remounted. That is what he has to really watch out for. If you can play well around that, either stay mounted in the first place, not get dismounted initially, or only look for these aggressive plays when the Olaf is up there, then I think it can work really well. And to be honest, teams aren't going to have a lot of practice playing against it. You also no. have a good way in for the Olaf in the team fight. You pop the ulti, you give incredible amounts of move speed to everyone coming in behind you, which can work wonders for someone like an Olaf. And I do love seeing Finn on a pick that, like you're saying, he's played before. He knows this champion. He's mm -hmm. comfortable on it. If you're sitting on a 1 and 10 record, take some chances like that. Play out of the meta. Use the comfort pick. Toss yep. him a curveball and see if they know how to hit it. And that's the challenge that CLG is issuing with this Kled pick. And he's done very well on it. You know, 10 games all time in pro, 8 and 2. And, and he has not always been on, you know, the most dominant team. So it's not like he has, you know, 80% win rate on all his champs and it's just another one on the <laughs> list, right? You know, this, this is his highest win rate uh, of any of the champs, you know, above two games. So, you know, this is kind of like his most successful champ with really uh, any games under the belt. So I'm really excited to see how he performs on it. I do think that Finn has been a standout member for CLG. I think that while I didn't have high expectations for him, you know, he was considered a weaker member on his team coming over from EU. He's a very young guy, and I think he has played well overall for CLG. They have not been able to make things come together as a squad, but at least Finn feels like, all right, this is a young player. He's looking pretty promising, someone you can maybe build around and uh, I want to see if he can perform on this clip. And the other thing I'm going to be watching this game and just in general for CLG is Poe Belter, right? Mm -hmm. He was subbed out early on, whatever the reasons are, not going to waste time speculating that here, but he subbed out, RJS replaces him. Now he's back in, RJS is back out. 
And we've got Poe Belter being the one who's supposed to come in here and help this squad get to a salvageable place. Poe Belter has done things like this in the past. We remember him coming into teams and trying to make some plays and magically materializing a couple of wins out of thin air. But at the same time, it is a tall, tall task, Azale. It really is. And I think... One of the hardest things is when your team is really in a slump. And anyone who knows knows this, who has played anything in from competitive gaming to sports to whatever, when you keep losing, it can get in your head, right? And it really can affect the mental. You lose confidence in your strategies. You lose confidence in your practice. So uh, that's where sometimes having a new player come in can hopefully reset the mental a little bit, can bring a bit of positivity into the team, and hopefully CLG can find something to build on there because they need to start picking up wins, if not for spring, then for summer, and any chance at trying to make it in towards Worlds. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb right now and say that uh, CLG will not be winning anything in spring. If I am wrong, I gift 1,000 subs in LCS chat. But I don't play it on... That's a lot of stuff, yeah, because I'm not going to be wrong. But Dignitas is now maybe having their top laner in the wrong spot. Okay, fake gods getting away. He's just fine. He's not too worried about it. And But yeah, CLG, it's a long-term plan, right? Like, there's a lot of things to fix. They've got to be fixing those things. They've got Poe Belter. They've got Finn. Everything's ready to go. This is what they wanted to have from the very beginning. Brox is here, too. Can they make it work? Do they have what it takes to bring everything in this roster together? Because as you pointed out, and I think this is one of the most important things, it's not a development roster, man. This is not one of those rosters. It's like, no. hey, let's bring up a bunch of green Always new names great. from the amateur scene. You know, like brand new guys nobody's ever heard of, like Wild Turtle and Poe Belter. That's just not the case. We yeah. need to see performance. Yep, they definitely do. I liked the attempt at the invade there from CLG. And, and had Fake God been sleeping a little bit and leveled you know, a skill before actually seeing someone, he could have at least forced a flash there. But because he held onto the skill point, that's something that you always talk about. Don't level a skill until there is a reason to do so. He holds onto the skill point, the invade comes in, but he just levels his E, slice and dice to safety. Um, but still, that forces out that wasted skill, which means that Finn gets full priority at level one here. And that's actually a big deal in matchups like this, when you are playing these aggressive matchups into a Renekton, uh, making the Renekton fully seed control of the wave is going to be a pretty big deal. And I'm going to be interested to see if Finn wants to actually hold his W skill point. Oftentimes what Kleds will do is at level two, you actually just don't skill up a point and you okay. wait until you have a fight. And then when you dismount, you level your W so that you have these reckless swings, you know, the quick attacks coming out and you can go for a quick remount. And that basically allows ah, you to have a one okay. time only on use W activation, right? Otherwise it just gets wasted on the minions. Then when it's on cooldown, they will engage. And I think we are going to see him do that. You know, see, he hits level three, he levels up the E, and he'll just hold on to that W point until he actually needs to do it for an all-in or for a remount. And I think that's something that you always want to see Kled players going for. It just uh, can make that first fight so much more effective. This is the most big brain Kled thing I've ever heard in my life. You are doing for Kled facts what I do for Skarner facts. <laughs> I never even thought about that before. It always registered to me that, yeah, W just gets wasted on minions a lot because you can't control when it activates. Yep. But saving the skill point, I like this. is why you're the it's literal world champion. It's a one-time active, you know? This is why you're the literal world champion, bro. You get to cast that spell one time per game. Yep. You think summoner spells are rough because of a five-minute cooldown? <laughs> Try a full hour cooldown. Damn. <laughs> talk about the cool value. <laughs> <laughs> that is a long cooldown. Oh, nice interrupt there. Turtle still manages to clear the wall, but that was so close. Smoothie with the re-engage here. Afromu is your target, and it is steak for dinner tonight. First blood over to Broxa. Sometimes you're the hero, sometimes you're the zero, and just barely. Afro does not stop Turtle from going over the wall there, so they can actually turn around on that engage. I mean, if he stopped him on the right side of the wall, he would have taken so much damage that probably CLG can't turn around that fight. Instead, just barely short. And CLG already out to an 800 gold lead here. They have the additional farm. The Olaf you know, was already ahead on camps. Now he's going to be able to get this topside scuttle very likely. I mean, he's double buff. I don't think Dardoch wants this. Oh, Dardoch, you got to be careful about that one, buddy. Oh, no, Aphromu headbutts him away, but he does not land a pulverize. Finn is now involved here in the fight, flashing forward for the second half of the bear trap on a rope. But goodbye, little baby Kled. See you later, buddy. Don't worry, Poe Belter's coming along for the ride. A double kill for Dardoch, a max range spear. Get over here. Triple kill for Dardoch in the jungle. Oh, my God. Just like that, the wheels fall off. We're only four minutes in. No.
but Dardock with a triple kill. It was a great early start there from CLG. They had one out in the early path thing. They had gotten the kill on the bottom side, grabbed themselves first blood. Off of this was just barely too slow. Aphromoon not getting the interrupt before Troll gets over the wall. And then Smoothie finding the opening, flashed in with the W, the stun to follow up. Brox and knocks him down. And then there was that subsequent skirmish up on this top side. Fake got coming in from the top. Saligo had really good positioning, is getting a lot of damage out from the side here. And the key thing is, Finn gets dismounted, levels his W, but then the stun was actually saved by Fake God. He didn't waste it early on the mounted Kled. He waited until he was dismounted, then stunned. He couldn't get the attacks off, couldn't get the remount. And unfortunately, Broxa unable to sidestep that spear means they can flash in and kill him off. At the very least though, CLG will be able to grab a dragon for themselves and the gold is still fairly even. So we'll have to track, right. can Dardock snowball the game from here? Because he was the big beneficiary of what happened. You know, Turtle farmed out bot side. He is up in farm. Uh, the wave was actually really bad for Fake God when they took that fight. It was pushing towards Finn and stacked up. So that's why Finn has a big CS advantage. So we'll have to track what Dardock can get done from here. Okay, Dardock 3 and 0 on a powerful jungler like a Nidalee. This is his chance to shine very, very brightly. Fake God continues to be just fine up here in the 1v1 against that Kled. Dardock with the double buffs prowling around this bottom side river. He will find a way into the enemy jungle, but he has to clear out this ward first. And it's not like there's any camps down here anyway. Broxa has been clearing through everything very effectively, as Olaf does, so not really much of a chance for Dardock to farm anything in here as Saligo will at least place down some vision to sort of keep an eye on when those camps are coming up and when Dardock can try to make a move. Mm -hmm. Dardock going to be invading pretty aggressively, but you can see Smoothie's already moving up towards the top side, and Dardock has been spotted. There is a chance to turn this around. Oh, and once again, they end up killing off Kled before he's able to use the remount. Very well done, coordinated here from Dignitas. The kill will once more go over to Dardock, and Nidalee is 4-0. and zero. Yeah, the Rail Roam was coming up, but Aphromu was faster on the play. Now scooping in the victor. Oh, Saligo has the angle. Poe Belter with the flash staying alive. Aphromu might just die to the Chaos Storm, but there's enough distance to still remain safe from that one. I'm surprised that a zero ulti hit him. It looked like it was a little bit too far to the side, but the very edge of the hitbox pulls Poe Belter away and ends up making him use his flash. Got them, them thick thighs, you know, got caught right on the edge, pulled back in. Colonel, I'm trying to get past the wall, but I'm dummy <laughs> thick. <laughs> All right, well, Dignitas getting active on the map. Afro, yes, he failed on that first play, but he has been very proactive. He bought the early Moby boots off their skirmish topside and just books it straight towards top. Fake God going back to the minion to hit six and level up the ultimate and immediately pop that. He would have just died to Finn 1v1 potentially if he had not had the presence of mind to get that last little bit of experience to get the ultimate to pop it. But once he does do that, again, saving the stun for the dismounted form. Afro's there for the follow-up. It guarantees the spear will land. And if you just keep getting killed off before the remounts, it tends to continue happening throughout the game. You know, you kind of hit this threshold where you're just not strong enough to ever survive for the remount. And Kled really does depend on that so heavily. You know, you've got to get yourself in a position where you can play aggressively. It's, it's a one-note champion. It's go forward, right? And if you can't yeah. do that, you are worthless. And you've got to be able to be strong enough to survive through that potential burst to get remounts or, or you can't make anything happen. Well... Down here in the bottom side, Neo and Afro Mool are still having to try to deal with Turtle and Smoothie. Smoothie only level four at this point in the game, so he has been rotating around a little bit. But while Turtle being level seven, they are very, very comfortable having this Tristana scale up and be powerful. In addition to just the normal strength that you get from leveling up, remember that Tristana does get the bonus range on every single level, making Turtle that much more scary. And it looks like Dignitas are making the call. Hey, back away. This could be really bad. They could be bringing people down here for a dive. And with Olaf hanging around, that is exactly what CLG would be able to do if Dignitas did not retreat. I mean, one problem here is despite the fact that Dig is up gold, it's all on Nidalee. And at a certain point in the game, you kind of stop caring how much gold Nidalee has, I feel like. Uh, and you really start caring about how much gold your Kai'Sa has, right? And Kai'Sa's down 40 CS at nine minutes. And Turtle is now picking up multiple plates. So yes, the Nidalee is huge, but unless Dardoch can constantly find picks and constantly get kills, that gets a lot less value, right? He is going probably Night Harvester. He is going to try to snowball the game, but Neo has, has quietly really fallen far behind. And that is concerning for Dignitas because he is going to be an important part of their composition uh, as the game goes further.
Afrin will about to face check the brush here, but he's Alistar. That's exactly where Alistar wants to be. Wild Turtle with a rocket jump away, but the rocket is about to crash back down to Earth. Welcome to the atmosphere, my friend. Neo taking the kill on that one and feeling great about it. Uh, CLG just kind of throwing away their bot lane advantage. When you see the Alistar face checking, I just don't understand. Why are they going for this? Alistar is six. When you see him running towards you, yeah. you could just jump away. Like, you both have your jump. And Turtle could just buster shot the Alistar right off the bat even, right? To, to like allow you to get that disengage. And then you just walk away from that, no problem. If the Alistar was pre-6, I would actually understand that because it's phase rushed Alistar and maybe you can burst him Kill down. Him. Yeah. But when you see he's level 6, you know he hasn't used his ultimate, or at least I hope you're tracking that. There's just no way you're going to kill him off there. Okay, CLG, we got to see a little bit of uh, removal of these types of mistakes. Just seems like an easy one to avoid, but considering yeah. they give the freebie over, hey, Dignitas is happy about it, man. No point in complaining about a free kill. Poe Belter will continue just clearing out waves here in the mid lane. Smoothie is nearby in case Dignitas tried to mount some sort of a dive against him. Junglers will encounter one another around Brox's red buff. But now, oh no, could this be another dive? Are they just going to kill Finn right off yeah, the bat? Yeah, looks here? like it. Fake God stepping forward, a TP showing up. Fake God continues moving in there, but a good interrupt is going to mean Finn walks away. Can Broxa do the same? Flash out keeps him in a decent enough spot. Still has Ragnarok, so Fake God doesn't want to do any sort of a flash stun follow up. Dignitas will not get a kill, but they have total control over the top side and they can go after these plates. Dardox summoning up the Rift Herald now. Second plate, uh, third plate, excuse me, will be mostly gone by the time Shelly gets off that charge, which means. This headbutt should pretty much secure them. First turret of the game. This stupid minion's walked in the way, so now Shelly got distracted. She has no attention span, but she does work. have a really hard head. And there we go. One big old headbutt, couple more little bonks on the turret, and there you go. First turret of the game over to Dignitas. And that is going to be such a big gold lead at this point for Fake God. It kind of feels like it's at the point of no return for the 1v1. Finn played it well to escape there. He buffered the ultimate to get that mini interrupt on Fake God to create space so he didn't actually have to flash away to avoid that stun, which was nicely played. But the fact that Dingsoss had three members up to that top side meant even with Brox around, they couldn't defend the turret. So they lose the tower. Finn loses even more gold, and that is really concerning. I think Dignitas has just understood the strengths of Kled as a champion very well. They know he needs to play aggressively, which exposes you to ganks. They know he needs to play from ahead, so they're going to him, they're putting him behind, they're punishing that aggression, and Finn is just kind of being put in the dirt. Really, really tragic game state right now for the side of CLG. You saw the gold pop up on the left side of your screen just a moment ago. And Wild Turtle is kind of the only person who's really competitive with the top earners of Dignitas. And even then, I say competitive as he's only 1,000 gold behind. Dignitas is feeling very comfortable with the current state of the game and the leads that they have on their champions that matter. The Nidalee in particular will have a lot of pressure on her to perform here in the mid game. We're just about 13 minutes in. Once the turret plates fall and people start rotating around more and we see those larger fights, it will be up to Dardoch to hit value spears, poke these guys down before the engages actually happen and continue moving the ball forward for Dignitas. And we may just see them continue to play through side lane, right? You already have this dominant Renekton. You're not worried about a 2v2. You've got four kills in the Nidalee. He's going Rocket Belt, which is actually very interesting. I can't say I've seen okay. Rocket Belt Nidalee uh, in pro Me play either. At, at all. You know, generally it, it's either Night Harvester or you go towards the Moonstaff style of build. So this is pretty interesting. It's going to be some additional playmaking. You know, it's, it's less single target burst. One of the things is nice about it is that it has uh, the passive that actually gives you, I want to say, magic pen, uh, the flat pen on it. So it's five magic penetration. You mean the mystic, one. the mythic stacking thing? Yeah, the mythic passive. Okay. So, you know, that is going to allow you, if you complete multiple items, to get some additional spell pen. Of course, he's not going Sork Boots, so he's not going to get, you know, to, to a kind of critical mass of that. Um, so to me, it feels mostly about just the playmaking, being able to close the gap, feeling like, hey, I'm so strong that I just need to be able to get to my opponents and I will kill them. And we'll see if that's going to be the case. All right, next, Drake not alive for three minutes. They're tied one to one right now, so it's not like there's much to really go to war over here on the current state of Summoner's Rift. But Aphromoo has found Smoothie. Nobody's around in time to turn it into a real punish. Broxa will step forward. Wild Turtle about to be killed off. A little bit more damage would have sealed the deal, but Turtle stays 
alive. Just barely. Back in the mid lane, though, the fight continues. CLG looking for a little bit of vengeance here as Aphromoo gets himself away. Alistar just cannot be punished. Dardock tosses out a spear. Oh, Froxen nearly walking right back into it, but close doesn't really matter here, and everybody walks away. Yeah, they do force out the flash from Aphromoo and the ultimate. It looked like he actually flashed backwards to absorb the ultimate coming in there from Finn. That is generally how you want to do it. I don't know if the flash is necessary, but you want to have your main tank essentially just step into that, absorb that charge, and shut down the engage. Because then from there, it is very difficult for the Kled to actually get past the Alistar. If the Alistar, every time Kled ult gets popped, just stands in front, make sure it hits him with the ultimate up, you take very little damage, and then from there, you can actually just headbutt the Kled away, and largely he has been disengaged. He's not going to be able to fight through you at that point to get to the Kai'Sa or the Azir. Down here in bottom side, let's see if Saligo wants to go after Pobelter. Doesn't look like it. He has no ulti, so no reason to overcommit to a fight where your opponent has more resources available. Saligo's job is just to clear the minions away from this turret. As you can see, CLG is posturing pretty aggressively here. They do have Broxa in the enemy jungle at that chicken camp. But on the Olaf, he is the jungler who is currently behind. Level 9 compared to level 10. Dardoch having so much extra EXP from being a part of those five kills for the side of Dignitas. And look at Aphromoo, man. He's just waiting, just in case. Pobelter gets a little too hyphy. Saligo's going in, goes forward for the shuffle, but the flash from Pobelter is fast enough. Yeah, good reaction there from Pobelter. Was a quick attempt from Saligo, but forcing out the flash for the ulti, always a win. And now it's going to be so dangerous for Victor to actually be playing out in that side lane. You could see Finn was actually down in the bottom lane trying to shadow Pobelter in case any sort of overchase happened. Then he could have looked for a play. But it doesn't end up being the case. He's got to get up towards top side to be able to collect this minion wave. And now for Finn, he really is in this position where you're just looking for picks. You know, when you're playing the Kled, you're playing from behind. You've got to find side lane plays. Got to find engages with that. But CLG being penned in here, they're going to siege up with this Rift Herald. And this tower should just be gone. Fake God is on a potential flank course here and will actually spot Kled coming in. So Fake God could just turn on Kled potentially. And that looks like it'll be the case. Shelly will fire off the second head, but. Azir turret summoned just so Dignitas are not in any sort of danger whatsoever. They'll continue clearing away the waves. Tier 2 turret for the side of CLG is down to about one third HP, but Dignitas know that the Drake is spawning. They should be the ones with priority over the river. They will arrive here first. Blue buff has now respawned in their opponent's jungle. We'll see if Dardok and Saligo are able to steal that one away just fine. Yes, they are. Does end up on Dardok. But considering Saligo still has his entire mana bar ready to go, they aren't too worried about it. Now let's see if CLG really wants to face check here. Smoothie losing half his HP, nearly the rest, as the Void Seeker and the Spear from the Nidalee both barely missed their target. And with control over the bottom side river, free Drake for Dig. Yep. And I think, honestly, it's better to have the blue buff on Dardak at this point because he went the Rock and Belt route. You, you don't have any mana from your mythic item, right? You haven't built up any, whereas Leandris does have the Lost Chapter as that build path, so Soliko will be a lot more okay with that. Uh, and Dardoch playing with the Rocket Belt, if you're just spamming out Spears, you're gonna go ooh so fast, but Dig moving around the map, taking down yet another tower here. They're going to extend the gold lead. Really looking good in this one. Have been very proactive. Then we'll try to clear this out, and it looks like it will be effective. Uh, as Kaisi did go back to base, they didn't actually commit to finishing this off. He wanted to be able to answer the top lane push, but right. still looking good. All right, back here in the mid lane, Fake God arrives with the TP in time to protect the tier one turret. CLG is still without a single turret taken here in this game. They got no turrets, Azale. There's no turrets. <laughs> These boys got to pick up some structures. Yeah, I know. They got to go to school, you know, get a degree, learn how to build some turrets. We'll see if they can get anything going. I'm not talking about building them, damn it. I'm talking about killing them. We need uh, to find not, the not stuff that the other guys built and knock it over. And it, <laughs> uh, no, an Azir turret does not count. Does not count. CLG's uh, yeah, got to shore up this. Get him, you know? Even if it is just that Azir <laughs> turret. And really, I mean, Azir turret does a lot of damage, but it's not very durable. It's kind of like no. you build a, a, a cardboard fort and then you put a cannon inside it, right? Like, it can still put out some punishment, <laughs> but that thing is going to not last very long. No. If it rains and the cardboard gets soggy, congratulations. Your mom just told you to clean up that pile of garbage in the front yard and throw <laughs> it out.
Well, that's about what the Azir turret is like after a while, but Dignitas are still managing to keep everything protected here. Having taken two turrets themselves, they're almost at a 4,000 gold lead here 19 minutes into the game. They're feeling all right. Yes, mm -hmm. they aren't continuing to build up the kills by great margins. It's still only five to one like it has been for quite a while, but considering the lead keeps on building, why force the issue? Yep, they are not really being pressured whatsoever. They have control. They've been pushing the pace as far as, you know, less about kills, but more about structures. They are grabbing some dragons for themselves. You can see they have the Azir down in this bottom lane, looking to try to knock down another turret while they're pressuring mid. And they just feel like they're pretty comfortable playing towards a potential soul or Baron, looking for the picks as they do find them and not feeling that they have to overforce. All righty, CLG. You guys are going to have to find us something here to have a chance because it doesn't feel like they've really got any angles. It doesn't feel like there's much of a plan right now to be able to stop this other than, hey, scale it up. We've got Tristana. If Tristana hits level 18 and six items, we can win the game. But that doesn't seem like a particularly effective strategy when things are going bad everywhere else on the map. Now it looks like Pobelter might be able to get away, but no, sir, the Hail Mary from downtown. It connects, and Neo shows up to catch his own pass and cash in for the second kill that he got this game. That was so nice from Neo. Long range W there, nails Pobelter. Without the flash, there was no way for him to avoid that one. And now it's straight onto the Baron here. They want to force at the very least a TP from Finn. And if he's not going to TP, they're just going to kill this. It will go down quickly. Kaisa, Azir, it feels like every single game paired up, shredding through Barons. It's so difficult to stop these two from doing it. So let's see if CLG can make it happen. Baron's down to 3K. Dignitas make the call to back off before it gets in stealable smite range. That means that CLG have accomplished their goal of at least holding this off for the time being. Yep, they do do that. But at the same time, as Dig, you just really wanted to force out the TP, right? They weren't going to commit to that until they could get some sort of a turn or force out the teleport. They get that teleport out. Here is the previous play. Long range, perfect aim there from Neo. Pobelter trying to turn back to dodge, but not enough time to do so. Neo grabbing that allows them to get not only the kill, but the teleport and the ultimate out of Finn. And without that, they could go right back to the Baron, honestly, if they want. You know, anytime Finn shows on bot side now without teleport, you can threaten this. You know, there's really hardly any better combos in the game than the Azir and Kai'Sa when it comes to killing objectives. Roxa throws an ax over the wall just to check because he knows, he knows how easy it is mm. for them to show up and just take that swiftly with the top laner on the other end of the map. Now, right now, Pobelter does still have a teleport ready to go, so they may just be swapping out Pobelter and Finn's positions on the side of CLG, have Finn be closer to the pit so he can rotate over with the ulti, put Pobelter elsewhere on the map so he can TP in with the global. But man, Four and a half thousand gold lead now. It keeps climbing up by five or six hundred yep. every time I check in on it, but it does not stop. Dignitas continues building the lead. Twelve seconds until the Infernal Drake shows up here yet again. Dignitas already with two Drakes collected. They would love to grab this one, move on to the sole point. After a move with a nice initiation here with a headbutt pull, but Smoothie's turning it right back around. Neo gets away, Smoothie does not. After a move wants to jump right back out of the fight here. Dignitas have taken a one for nothing but CLG still have higher quality health bars on the remaining four men. Now let's see if Dignitas can translate this into an objective take here. They still have heals from Dardoch that'll help keep these guys topped off. Nice spear connecting onto Wild Turtle, taking him down to about half HP. Fake God and Aphromoo still ready to go here on this front line, have cooldowns now. Infernal Drake down to 2,500 HP. Neo putting the work in on that one. Aphromoo starting off the fight, a little bit more damage poured in and there you go. Dardock unstoppable as Finn tries to get away. Dardock lands another spear with a follow-up damage over the wall and lightning strikes. Electrocute from Saligo ends up picking up the kill as he goes over the wall. Pobelter still hanging around here as Dardock steals away the Gromp. At least Pobelter will take that back. But a Gromp traded for four kills and a Drake? Worst trade deal. History of trade deals, definitely ever. No. Yeah, it's not what they wanted to see. They go for the engage, and Smoothie honestly had a very good turn here. You know, gets comboed, but then finds both Dardoch and Neo. They just didn't have the follow-up there, didn't have the damage coming through, as Soligo and Fake God warded members away from continuing that. And then Afro just finds the angle, 
Three members stack up. He goes in, even getting out with his life thanks to the ulti. And they're able to chase down even more kills here as the spear landed. The lightning strikes, as you said. The Electro finishing him off. And Dignitas now over 6,000 gold ahead. One Dragon off Damn. soul. The item completions are coming through left and right. You can see two to two and a half items really across the board here for Dignitas. Well, it feels like most people on CLG are just one in pieces. CLG has, I don't want to say it again. I don't want to say they've got to find a way to stabilize this because it feels like that's just been the story for so long. We yeah. reached the mid game. The tragedy for CLG this game is that they didn't even have the good early phases that they've had in the past, right? Yes, they managed to grab the first blood in the bottom side river after the bit of a mistake from Afromu, but then immediately thereafter, they have a bad fight in the top side river. The game turns south, and it's been heading further south the entire time. Mm -hmm. So I'm just struggling to find that silver lining here for CLG in this game because the whole damn thing looks like a rain cloud, Isaac. Yeah, I feel like, to be honest, that dragon fight may have been you know, their best shot because there was a lot of low health bars and they had you know, full HP on multiple carries there. They weren't able to get in. They stacked up. They got combled. They got taken down. And now it is going to be really tough here. Fake God just trying to stop any potential TP from Pobelto to come in there. They start up the Baron, but they will pull off. If they can just continue the game longer and longer and longer and get Wild Turtle, get Pole Belter to a really strong point, maybe they can make something happen. Aphromoo jumping in, and Neo's right beside him. Olaf trying to provide Thank a little God. bit of pressure here, but Smoothie's finding the Magnet Storm here off to the other side. Shutdown coming through as Finn grabs a kill on the enemy AD. Carry Saligo's going to be kept alive here for a moment. Fake God grabbing a return kill on the enemy jungler. Broxa is down. Let's see if Wild Turtle's able to escape. Yes, he will. Stasis for Dardock. Shut down on a Saligo, and that one is big. Oh. Hovelter grabbing one on the Afro Moon now, too. C L G, do you believe it? They take a fight, and they're still alive here in this game. As soon as you stop believing, that's when they start performing. It's the age-old <laughs> story of CLG. We just had to doubt them a little bit more. Think that it's out of reach for sure this time. And CLG comes up with the team fight win there. A big one for them as they're able to find the turnaround here. Wild Turtle actually got interrupted on his jump, but Neo used his jump very early on. And Brox is right on top of him. Finn is able to get back to to that back line and actually finish off the Kai'Sa. And then I want to see what actually killed him. Was that explosive shot on the Renekton in there? It was. They lost <laughs> track of it. I was wondering how he actually killed him there because I know he wasn't against Saligo. And their E was actually on Renekton. And Saligo just didn't realize that the explosive charge was about to detonate. So stayed on top. That blows up and gives Turtle the kill, which also gives him a reset and allows him to jump away. So a pretty big mistake there. Dingtoss still in control, still up a couple thousand gold, but CLG with a huge win, both for confidence and for game state. He walked on top of the bomb. Wow, what a big error there that ends up giving CLG a fight. Okay, okay, signs of life for Counter Logic Gaming. Spear flies out, doesn't find a target. CLG getting into a bit of a scrap here in the top side against Fake God, but Finn backs away. Next Drake's in 25 seconds. CLG cannot afford to lose any ground, send anybody home, whatever. This is infernal soul for their opponents. That is thousands of gold worth of value if Dignitas secure yeah. this next Drake. What is the response from CLG? Well, and Pobelter's spotted, and he's actually split from his team, so now this is pretty awkward. We'll have to see, because Dardock is, is on that side. He's actually going to try to pick Pobelter as he comes across. We'll see. CLG is regrouping, so they are going to be together as a squad. Turtles pushing out mid, but they've got to watch out for these after moon engages because time and time again, they have grouped as they go through. Well, it's Smoothie starting it off this time. Brox has already got the kill on Neo. Fake God's about to die now, too. CLG finally being brave enough to go in to make a big play, and it rewards them with the enemy AD carry. There's still four alive on the side of Dig, though. This is not over yet. CLG must be able to see this through if they want to stop this soul take. 
Broxa has his smite, so does Dardock. Drake down to 3,500. Dardock into the stasis immediately right now. Fake God having to try to run back. Poe Belter grabbing a kill there. Dardock's now your target. No stasis left to go. Afro move with a two man knockup. Finn's still on the chase, running like crazy, but it's a double kill back to POB. Finn will retreat now at this point. Spear flies out, but it won't find anyone of value. Poe Belter continues moving forward, looking for a little bit more damage onto Saligo. Needs to find something else now. The stasis comes in. The laser goes down. Dignitas are ace, and CLG will stop the soul. And they continued trying to get more there. Saligo and Dardock refusing to give up on the play, end up just giving over their lives. And now CLG can take the Baron and get control of this game once more. And now watch Afro move. Smoothie goes in, and Afro goes for the combo, but he actually gets interrupted by Finn's ultimate on his combo. So the headbutt gets knocked out of the air, and as a result, the Pulverize misses everyone, so the counter engage does not come through because of a beautifully timed Kled ultimate there on the CLG side. They kill off Neo immediately, and then it was just about the extended play. You know, they're playing from such an advantage, they find the flash in. Finn getting on top of Dardock with the attract repel from that rel, able to force out the Zonias, and then it's really just the chase down. And Saligo and Dardock needed to fully bail out, but they wanted to try to scrape something out of this. But as Saligo steps back, now your E's on cooldown, you've walked too close to Pobelter, and he's gonna be able to chase in and grab these last couple kills. This just feels a bit disrespectful from Dignitas. Yeah. Sticking around that long there with the last two players alive, thinking, okay, we're the better team. Clearly, we should be able to pick something up at the end of this. We can't just have a fight go that bad. But holy Pope, man, the notorious <laughs> P-O-B. 7,755 damage in that last team fight. Is that more? 6,000 plus four. Yeah, that's more than the whole enemy team put together. The whole wow. enemy team put together. Or wait, maybe my math's bad. I don't know. It's close. It's close to the whole enemy team put it's together. A There's a region. The other team has small numbers. Yes, their numbers suck. And Poe Belters did not in that last team fight. Poe Belter popped off in a way that can keep this team alive and keep them going in this game against Dignitas. Armed with a Baron buff, CLG are finally in control and they're taking things to the Dignitas base itself. Fake God gets caught out of position here by the ulti from the Kled. Poe Belter goes unstoppable. CLG marching down the mid lane looking for their first inhibitor turret here of the game. Spears continue to fly out, but CLG does a good job playing around their own minions to dodge those and tank the hits. Broxa will continue leading the charge here for the squad. Wild Turtle just needs to get those auto attacks in on the inhibitor, but they do not want to overcommit. They do not want to allow Dignitas a position of strength back in this game. Cardboard Castle summoned up, but not in time to protect that inhibitor. See you later, Azir Turret will only continue to do so much. As up here on the top side, Finn is already priming the next wave here for CLG. They have collected so much gold already, plus 4,100 gold on the Red Bull Baron so far, and it's not ending yet. I mean, Fake God's still not back up. Tristana destroys these towers, but Turtle has to be a bit careful. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just sticking around the wrong spot for two seconds is two seconds too many. So CLG are happy to get out of here. They are happy to take what they got, the inhibitor in mid lane, the inhibitor turret in the top side. This is an incredible comeback, an incredible throw, or a little bit of both, Azale. Yeah, I would say a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. I think that CLG has done a great job playing out in some of these team fights they've been victorious in, smoothly finding big engages, and in back-to-back -back fights, they were able to kill off Neo very early on. You know, that really was the difference, both in that mid lane fight that CLG won, as well as the one over by the Dragon, is they got to the key target, they got to the Kai'Sa, they killed her off right to begin, and that just put them in such a position of power because there was no longer enough threat over on the Dignitas side. We have so much gold in the pockets of Dardock here on this Nidalee. He just can't do that much in a 5v5 compared to some of these other champions. So CLG now in a pretty big position of power. Turtle and Poe Belter are way ahead of their counterparts. They have gotten a tremendous amount of gold. You can see the gold lead that Dignitas had built up. It was up to 6,000 plus gold. They are now down 3,800 at the worst. So an incredible swing of nearly 10,000 gold there. Absolutely wild wild stuff 
from CLG coming back in this game. This is the kind of things people oh, want to Neo. see. This veteran squad finding the opportunities and the angles to come back into the game even from a deficit. Dardox stuck in the stasis. Broxa after him here with a Ragnarok grabbing the kill on that one. Pobelter wanting to get himself away. Sharima Shuffle coming in. Smoothie grabbing the kill onto Afromu. Saligo stuck in the middle and he's about to die. Finn's grabbing a follow-up kill here. Now look at what CLG is doing running down the remaining players on Dignitas. Fake God's the last man standing. And he makes a real nice pair of crocodile boots. It was a huge comeback. It was a huge play. It was a Bud Light ace. And CLG will double their wins and take down Dignitas. That is so big for CLG, for the confidence of the team. Not only do they take down a team that is up near the top of the table, they do it in astounding fashion here, coming back from nearly 7,000 gold. Finn and Broxa hugging it out, looking really happy about that. And to do it as well with the pocket pick, the Kled was not working in the early game, was preyed on heavily by Dignitas, but was critical in a lot of these team fights. At the Dragon fight, rejecting the engage coming through from Aphromoo with some really good timing on that Kled ult. The knockup actually interrupted the headbutt pulverized from Aphromoo, then utilizing that again to catch out Neo in one circumstance, to catch out Fake God on that pick that did eventually end to that game-ending play. So really big stuff here from CLG back in the win column, and it's one step towards riding the ship. So, I mean, is it too early to say this? CLG win in spring? Am I going to have to <laughs> gift a 1,000 subs after all? CLG is going to win spring? Like, <laughs> am I worried now? Will is CLG, CLG going to win spring? Win worlds? Oh, yes. Spring is, spring is not enough. They got to go straight to worlds, get the dub. I mean, hey, jokes aside, it was an incredible comeback that CLG was able was. to make in this game to find the opportunities from the deficit that they were at, especially in, against a team that is one of the better teams in the league right now in Dignitas. So, hey, hats off to CLG for that one. Congratulations to this squad. Broxa, I am looking forward to seeing the positive mental tweet now that you don't have to think about what to tweet anymore. Well deserved to CLG. We're going on a break here one more time. After that, Riv's going to be talking with Broxa himself in the Verizon post-game interview. Don't y'all go anywhere. CLG's got that win streak, 100% of their last game. Oh, baby.
Welcome back to the Verizon Post Game Interview. I'm Riv, and I am joined by Counter Logic Gaming's Broxa. That's right, you didn't hear wrong. See all these Broxa as they take down Dignitas. And it's it was all from the first blood, right? It was secured there. Isn't that how the first game felt, Broxa? <laughs> or the first part of the game? <laughs> to be fair, it was, uh, this, this game was an experience, because every other game I felt like we had control in the early game. Everything was going great. This game, it went horribly wrong i think that nidalee had three kills three minutes into the game <laughs> i was scared for my life to even into my jungle and then this one game where we fail massively in the early game is it's the one we're winning like it just doesn't make any sense to me anymore but i'm very happy that's for sure right in the end as captain flowers said that this was probably an easier tweet to make yeah no definitely this one was simple <laughs> like yesterday and the day before that, I was really thinking, like, hmm, what do I tweet after this loss? Like, I really want to tell my fans something, you know? But this one was simple and easy. I just tweeted, yeah. we won a game, plain, simple, easy, pretty straightforward. And, yeah, we actually won a game, believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, it's that, do I tweet? Will it age like wine or age like milk? How does it go? Uh, so, <laughs> changes. Changes from the team still. You come in, and then things shuffle around a little bit. Uh, things start to look better. How long has kind of Pole Belter been uh, in thought for the team roster? Has he been scrimming and you were just waiting to bring him up here? How long has that been in the mix? Yeah, so um, I think there's a lot of reasons as to why we haven't been doing uh, too well, why we haven't been too consistent these past weeks. And uh, the roster shuffles are definitely part of it because we don't have that much experience as a team. Uh, if we look back on last week, I scrimmed with the team two days where we were still playing with RGS. Um, in, in going into the LCS week. This week, I think Poe Belder had three days of scrims. So there's just been some shuffles happening constantly. We haven't really had much time so to practice together with this five-man unit. And mm -hmm. I think that lack of practice has really been showing in our mid-late game especially. I think early game, we've usually been doing pretty well. We can show up as individuals and we can... It's like everyone kind of knows their role in the early game. It's pretty straightforward. But sometimes when we get to the mid-late game where... Uh, the synergy, the coordination, and just gelling as a team. When, when that is so important, that's where we've usually yeah. been, been making mistakes. And I think the lack of practice is, is the biggest reason as to, to why that is. Right, and how, how are things feeling now, though, uh, kind of if, if you were to take it after these games? Obviously, a win feels great, but is this uh, kind of something you can replicate where the team came from after you were able to come back? Um, I, I definitely think that... We have a lot, uh, a lot of work to do. We can grow a lot as a team, and um, all the losses have been feeling kind of bittersweet in a way because I think we were in a position where we could have won the game uh, if we we had a bit of a better macro, a bit better team play. Um, and now we have some time to, you know, just practice, grind together with these five players and just chill as a team. And things are not looking great for us in the spring split. And it, it feels kind of bad saying this, but at this point, I think we, we just need to try to think of it in the long term. Obviously, we need to get some wins on the board. We need to do everything we can to win. But ultimately, just practicing together and getting that synergy is, is going to be key going forward. And um, I think it showed today that our macro in the mid-late game is better. This game, we were even behind. We actually managed to set up some good plays to come back. So hopefully next weekend, with a bit more practice, we can actually consistently use all these world from a head to. Well, it's Brox, it honestly sounds like CLG is heading out to check all of the boxes necessary here to really make a comeback. It was awesome to see the win today for the team. I'm sure the fans are happy. Before we headed to the Bud Light breakdown, I want to say thanks for joining me. It was a pleasure as always. Yeah, welcome to the Bud Light Woo! Breakdown. It's the perfect place to party if you're a CLG fan. <laughs> Woo! And gosh. They did it. Oh, they finally did it. <laughs> you're the only one to predict uh, that they would take this game here today, Cody. They did. I had to. CLG gave me this uh, shirt with the I never doubted them uh, quote on oh. it. Complete. <laughs> and uh, that actually improves my, uh, my predictions as well. So thank you, CLG. All right. They finally put it together. First blood and the victory. Wins all around. Yeah, they didn't even have to sacrifice their 100% first blood <laughs> that they have going right now. So many things to be happy about. So with the celebration, let's go ahead and reflect upon some of the high points of the game. Kobe, you are the CLG person that we got here. What did you make of this play? Well, uh, this one, and Isaiah called it out during the game, but 
the explosive shot on Renekton's head that Saligo comes back into the fight and walks up right next to him for the reset is just a tragedy for Dignitas, but exactly what CLG need. Look at that. He's walking right next to him for a good two seconds with that explosive shot on his head. Then it blows up and they're, they're, it's, it's all CLG from there on. They take that win, big team fight victory. That gave them confidence. From then on, they just use this Kled. Ultimate in, charge forward, give that Kled speed to the Olaf, allow Broxa and Finn to charge through the front line, get these engages. They get another pick at Dragon and Crumbs. Then they're able to stop the Dragon as well with the re-engage, just resetting here, 5v4. Yes, I love that they actually focus on the team fight. You have a numbers advantage, and this is that late game decision making that CLG is improving upon because so many teams that we have seen making mistakes focus on the dragon thinking, oh yeah, we can just take it for free, but no. Free 5v4, they go for it and just put Dig in the dirt because you get so many more kills because Soligo continues to stay here and even Darda comes in for a little extra bono here. So it really turned the ties to get so many fights back to back with objective gain after. Yeah, I mean, we just heard Broxa talking in the interview about the fact that they were behind and they were able to keep themselves collected going into it later, keeping their macro in line. Emily, what do you think that means for a team like CLG, considering that a lot of the teams lower in the standings usually tend to struggle a bit more as the game goes on? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even necessarily say it's keeping their macro in line uh, necessarily, but they did outscale them, um, and they did end up playing these later game team fights really well. And I think, I mean, Broxa said it himself in the interview where he's just talking about the more they get to play together, the better they will hopefully look as a team, right? So with the roster swaps, with him being late on his visa, like, I know people are probably sick of mm, people repeating this, but, like, it does cut down on how much practice time they've actually had as a unit. Um, so, you know what, like locking in a late game scaling comp is not a bad call in that case because, uh, you know, if all else fails, you do end up outscaling them. And that's what happened in this game. I think another interesting thing that CLG did was the Olaf priority. We saw Cloud9 take the Olaf priority against 100 Thieves. It really popped off, and especially when paired with either the Renekton or another Diver like the Kled can really do a lot of damage to the backline. So I like that little adaptation saying, the best team's doing this, we should do it too. And for all the CLG fans out there, we'll relive the final moment <laughs> of this game, which was just kind of gearing over from what we saw CLG being able to bring it back here, Kobe. Yeah, this was a big one. Uh, steam rolling right on through. This is the moment they actually knew that every CLG <laughs> fan could finally let out that breath because until they get inside the base, until they kill the Nexus, uh, you don't want to give away too much faith here. And CLG, after that last run down mid, are able to finish the game. Now two victories. This means they actually still have chances at playoffs. Uh, technically, so. It is definitely going to be very difficult. It is not going to be likely, but they do have a chance uh, there. So there's definitely something to root for. And if you're looking at the gold graph here, too, I mean, Dignitas definitely had some control here over the early game. Emily, I feel like you cannot discount some of the strength that they have been bringing time and time again. Yeah, I was going to say, this is another gold graph where we look at it and we're like, oof, that was a, that was a fun one. Um, I think one thing that did happen with Dig early, and I'm not going to say, like, this is the reason why they lost, because I don't, I don't like bringing down reasons to why teams lose in general sometimes but um i do think it was kind of unfortunate that a lot of these early kills did end up on the nidalee because that does mean that you kind of have to snowball things really quickly against uh the scaling composition that clg has right so like if you look at that final end uh damage numbers you know victor is going to be off the charts and he has a, a massive amount of zone control um he can zone this entire team off of like especially with the renekton trying to dive in and assassinate their carries i just think um, it was kind of unfortunate that a lot of those kills ended up on Nidalee. I don't necessarily like Nidalee without a certain amount of setup so that she can constantly hit those spears. And then I think you still kind of have to snowball it if you don't have other late game uh, solutions, if that makes sense. 
CLG definitely took full advantage of their late game security Dignitas while having shining moments early on didn't quite pan out for them later on in the game. But with that sweet, sweet CLG victory for all the CLG fans out there, we have solidified our standings here in week four. Cloud9 have only increased their first place lead and now sit two games ahead of 100 Thieves and TSM who are currently tied for second. Hot on their heels are Dignitas, Evil Geniuses, and Team Liquid together in fourth place. Speaking of kind of the top of the standings right there, we did see Cloud9 and 100 Thieves facing off earlier. Emily, I know you had some thoughts on what this means for the teams and how they actually looked in that game when trying to fight for that number one spot. Yeah, I mean, I thought it was kind of just a massive flex of Perks locking in the LeBlanc uh, against Demonte's Azir. That's something that I kind of wanted to throw out there because I think, um, you know, that was definitely a, a skill check uh, from draft. I don't necessarily think that LeBlanc is particularly strong, although I'm curious to see her with Everfrost, actually, which he did not build in this game. He went Ludens, uh, if I remember. Hey, guys, first. That's, yeah, a, uh, that's the biggest flex of them all. He literally <laughs> just leaves his lost chapter there, doesn't even complete his first item, and upgrades to Medjai's. That's the yeah. biggest flex of all time. I mean, he solo he so killed Demonte. And I'm, this isn't here to dunk on Demonte. It's just, like, from the get-go, if you're locking that in, this is a... I am skill checking you in lane, and that is what ended up happening. So it was very entertaining to watch. Yep. That's Multiple amigo. entertaining games. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like the word of skill check. To me, before the skill check became a word, it was just, I think I'm better than you. So I, I like that phrasing as well. It's like, the Perks <laughs> thought he was better, and he proved it. That's a good attitude to have, oh, though. Man, we def you gotta rely <laughs> on your thought. hands. Like, that's, that's the, at the end of the day, most of the game is that. Yeah. Through the man's worked out for Cloud9 earlier as they still hold on to that number one spot. Let's go ahead and take a look at next week's schedule, starting with our games on Friday. We're going to be kicking off the second week of our round robin with a banger between TSM and Dignitas, with 100 Thieves taking on Evil Geniuses right after, before closing out the day with the Mortals versus Counter Logic Gaming, now 2-10 in, in their record. So as far as everything else we got going on, don't forget that this Monday kicks off the second week of the Unified Grand Prix, where the top four amateur teams who have secured their spot in the LCS Proving Grounds are taking on some of the top teams in Academy. Be sure to tune in all week long on twitch.tv slash academy to support rising talent. We've also got The Dive releasing at 5 a.m. on Tuesday for all of our friends in Europe Ooh. to get the first dibs on. And as well as this or that coming up your way on Thursday Ooh. before we kick it with us here on the LCS again on Friday. Should be an action-packed week. Plenty of content for all of our fans out there to look forward to. But we do have a final piece of business here on the broadcast. Let's toss it over to Flowers and Azale to award the MasterCard Player of the Week. Thank you very much, Latigris. It is that time here once more. We are 15 games further into this year's competitive play than we were before we started back on Friday. So we've got to acknowledge whoever is making the biggest, baddest, chattest types of moves. And this weekend, I will tell you exactly who it was. And the man's name is Blabber. The king of the jungle reigns supreme yet again with a 3-0 weekend for C9. Feels like everyone has just kind of unanimously agreed that he is the best jungler in the LCS right now. And he is leaving absolutely no doubt. He's playing a variety of styles. He is crushing opponents on every single one of them. And it just feels like more than any other jungler in the league right now, he takes over games, he makes them about him, and he really is putting his stamp on this league. Very, very good stuff. Look at the KP in that first game, especially 91.7%. The man is just a monster here in the jungle for Cloud9. Always getting things done, always being such an important part of their success. It reminds me of back when C9 was just a terror the first half of last year, and so much of it was built off of Blabber's success. And I'm sure all the fans are happy to see him popping off in that same sort of a way, too. But the weekend is not yet quite over, despite the fact that the games now are. The show continues with the Bud Light League Lounge with Dash, Latigris, Kobe, and Destiny over at twitch.tv forward slash Bud Light. But that does conclude our games, so on behalf of myself, 
the casters, the analysts, the broadcast crew, and all those Skarner picks we are now getting to see. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. Good night.